Hey. Good morning. Good morning. It is Youth Pastor Takeover again. Yeah, I hope we didn't just lose people by saying that. <laughs> Let me get back on here when the real pastors are here. Right? I don't know. Right. I, I, I was told they enjoy the, the youthfulness. I know somebody told me that. I mean, they might have just been blowing smoke, but yeah. You know, when, with her, when we're with our students, we're the old guys. But like in other contexts, it's kind of nice to be the younger guy, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird place to be, isn't it? Like you're you're too old for those that you're actually teaching, but then too young for some other people to take you seriously. It's kind of weird. I mean, I think I'm in a better spot than when I was like 20 years old. Because when I was 20 years old, I really was like lost in limbo. It's like you're forever out of the beardless world, but yet you're not even considered an adult by some by a lot of people. Right. And even now, well, here I, we are. somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle. God's word. Yeah. <laughs> So we're in Philippians. Uh, I did not get to listen to the pastors yesterday. So I, I know where we're starting, but I, I also think we, I, I want to talk a little bit about what they talked about just because it's context for what we're about to read. Yeah, we need to kind of ease into it mm -hmm, for sure. Oh, yeah. Um, other than that, do we have anything new to share with the people? No, I mean, I think, like, of course, the church... And in, in the different children's and youth ministries, we're already thinking about Christmas. I mean, not we're, I mean, we're not just starting to think about it. We've got plans in place. You know, I mean, that's just how we got to be. This year's kind of flying well, by, which true. does not make me sad at this point. <laughs> church people in, well, churches in general plan for Christmas way ahead of time. Right. But I'm one, I, I really like Christmas, so... Me and Amber already had the conversation. When do we get our tree? Because we always get a real tree. When do we go do that? When do we put up lights? And we, we kind of have a tradition that like Thanksgiving Day is still Thanksgiving, and then the next day we do it. And I was, I was asking her, do you want to do it early this year? And she's like, nope, keep our tradition. So, well, see, my dad was born on December seventh, so that was something. That was a tradition he started. Let me have my birthday. So we oh. never put up our tree until December eighth. <laughs> by a lot of people's standards is like some people have had their tree up by for weeks by then and december 8th is late by some standards um maybe so. maybe people don't care maybe people hate that we're talking about christmas right now <laughs> but one more fun fact um so it used to be and I'm cutting that, out. yeah i know right it used to be that we would celebrate advent mm -hmm. and that was preparing for christmas but you really didn't do Christmas trees or Christmas. You didn't really decorate the house until Christmas, until like Christmas Day. And then you celebrated it for like those 12 days after, like the 12 days of Christmas. Right. So a lot of a lot of societies did that. A lot of cultures did that. So we're kind of the odd ones that we celebrate Christmas for. I mean, honestly, right after Halloween, stores are going to be puking Christmas everywhere. And so oh. actually, I used to work in retail and Halloween and Christmas merchandise came on the same truck. That's just ridiculous. In September, you know. So it was, no, let's just do one holiday at a time. All right. So we're done talking about Christmas. We're done with that. All right. Sorry, peeps. So we're in Philippians, right? Philippians. All right. So Philippians, we're still in chapter one. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I just, the one thing I wanted to say is that we ended, well, they ended, it looks like with verse 21, which is for me to live is Christ and to die is <laughs> mm -hmm. And we won't talk too much about that because the next couple verses, I feel like Paul explains himself a little bit. And so mm -hmm. I like this. Yeah, so that does give you a nice segue. That gives you some co context here. Living is Christ. Dying is gain. My version says dying is even better. So I'm going to continue reading that in the New Living Translation. There you go. Starting with Philippians 1.22. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. I can. Uh, so I really don't know which is better. So he's conflicted here. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. I know for sure I felt that way about my wife and my children. Yeah. Like, that is my greatest fear about dying is not that my life would end or that I wanted to do more with my life. But then there would be people left behind with a void yeah and i was actually gonna say this pause and talk about that because that's a lot to chew on right there like um i as i get older um 
going to be 32 this year, right? <laughs> As I get older, I am there. noticing that this is becoming more true of me, where I long for the day when Jesus comes back and uh, that day when he takes us up with him and then he's going to come back to earth and, and make it all right again. Um, I long for that day, but yet I also, I'm like, oh, I want Jesus to come back. But, and my heart goes, well, what about those people that I know that don't know Jesus? And my heart aches for them too. So I, I feel that that pull of like, I don't know which one I want more. I don't know. So, and, and again, to stay is far better for you guys if we stay and keep preaching the news and we keep discipling. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong about wanting to experience more life or wanting to continue to have these important connections with people. But here, the first thing he talks about is if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. Yeah. Like that is his focus. That's the first thing that comes to mind. So I don't know which is better, to go be with Christ or to go work for Christ. Like, talk about being super on like on what Christ has done and and it truly changing your priorities. Ooh. So let's talk about that for a second. Like <laughs> being super focused. Um and we just got distracted by Christmas there and we know it's going to happen. Black Friday, all this stuff. Everything's going to almost like overshadow what we're here. The great we just got done with Matthew with the great commission that mm -hmm. we do have a job to share the gospel and to to help uh, other believers become more mature and become more like Christ. And there's there's so much work to do, and yet we can get so distracted. And so this is a good reminder that uh, we we are here because it's for other people. Because mm -hmm. if, if we had no use anymore, we'd be done, right? Like the reason why God doesn't like take you up instantly when you say, you know, the prayer when you finally give your heart over to Jesus and you you turn your feet completely and repent. The reason why you don't go to heaven is because, well, now you've got work to do. Yes, you're saved, and the Holy Spirit seals you, and you are saved for eternity. But you're here for a reason. So, we need, yeah, that's a, that's a focus we need to keep for sure. Well, can you imagine how different the Christian faith would be if uh, God had a different plan for people to find out besides using people? Right. Um, and once you found Jesus, found salvation, you know, let him do that work in your heart. You you just went up to heaven, like, in an instant. Like, there, there essentially would be no people left, right? <laughs> Everyone would be like, what happened to Christ? Oh, Dude. I think the world might be worse than it is right now. <laughs> you you start losing, you all the, the world yeah. just gets darker and darker. Right. So knowing this, he's convinced that he will remain alive in verse 25, or chapter, yes, verse 25. Knowing this, I am convinced that I will remain alive. Why? So I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. So it's not just about, it's not only growing, but experiencing the joy in this faith, right? Oh, yeah. And when I come to you again, you will have even more reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because of what he is doing through me. So I want to point this out. He is, I looked up a little bit of stuff. Um, he's in the, the Palpatine jail or Memorine jail. Anyways, he's in the jail in Rome. That's tradition. Nobody really knows for sure. But the tradition says that he's in that jail right before he meets Caesar and Nero. Um, and that's where he's waiting. And in Philippians, he's he's saying, when I meet you again, when I come to you again, like uh, we know now that um, eventually he realizes that he's going to die. Um, he ends up, when he finally does get to the place he wanted to go and is able to preach it to the officials in Rome, uh, what he ends up getting is his head chopped off, right? Like he ends up, um, I can't remember the final end to, to Paul right now. But yeah, so he's still... Full of joy, even though he's like chained to the top of the top um, officers. Like he's, he is right, if, it, if it's true, if tradition is true, then it's right before he meets Caesar. And he's going to be chained to like secret service type people, like the top of their game type of soldiers. And he's chained to them. And he's saying that, man, like 
I want, I'm glad I'm here to continue the progress and joy of your faith. And I can't wait to see you again. And I'm like, wow, what a, what a guy. Like, I feel like I get in that like bummer state of mood so easily. And here Paul is like, not even like, yeah, this, it's like he's singing in this book, right? It's like some people call Philippians the book of joy. And if you need joy, you read Philippians. If you're going through a hard thing in life, read Philippians. So, yeah. I'm able to confirm um, without super fact checking my resource. This is just a Google. Um, and, and, and hearing it makes me go, oh, yes, I knew that. Paul was executed in 68 AD during Nero's persecution by beheading him since he was a Roman citizen. If he hadn't been a Roman citizen, he would have been crucified. Yeah. I don't know why. They, yeah, that. That left both of our brains there for a minute, but that's like, oh yeah, I knew that. <laughs> yeah, I thought you'd say there you go. So there, that was oof. Do you have anything else to add to that? I don't think so. I think you covered that pretty well. Um right. I've got to find my spot again because when I flipped to do that Google search here, I lost uh, uh, knowing this, I'm al I'll remain alive. The joy of your faith, come again, doing through me. Got it. All right. So that means we're in verse 27. Live as citizens of heaven. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then, whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit, one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. So that's living as though you have your own subculture, right? As you have your own people now, you have a new tribe and we live a different way. You must conduct yourselves in a way that's worthy of just even the news of Christ. So yeah, mine says, I feel like you have a lot more words than I do. Like, so mine just says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And then it goes on to say, so whether I am, I see you or I'm absent, but it's just like, um, we, we take that seriously here at the church. I just want to let some people know, um, especially with small group leaders and move where they're, they're teaching students, they're really discipling them. Um, I, I get on them about, Hey, your conduct needs to reflect Christ. It needs to reflect the gospel. Uh, so on Facebook, if you're posting things that aren't appropriate, I'm going to contact you. Don't get offended. I'm just trying to help you to live in such a way, because if a parent sees you in not so good way, and you're teaching their student, that could be detrimental for our ministry. Um, it looks bad on you. Yeah. Really, and the heart behind that is we want to maximize your impact for God's kingdom. We are, like, on your side, hoping to empower you, hoping to, you know, come alongside you hand in hand. So it's, there's no heart of, like, condemnation or judgment. Yeah. judgment that It's, you know what? I feel like you're losing influence and I don't want that for you. Yeah. We don't kick people out. Of, we don't kick people out of the leadership role, but we, we just walk beside them and go, Hey, that's not a wise move right now. Let's, let's fix that. <laughs> so it sounds like he had a kind of an idea, Paul, that maybe I'll come see you again, or maybe, if, maybe I'll only hear about you. So maybe he, he knew something was up in the pipeline maybe. And he continued by saying, don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved, even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. We are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of it. So if there, he's mentioning not to be intimidated by your enemies. He's probably addressing a real issue that was happening, right? They probably were people that were felt. In, I mean, they, they lived in a world where he was. He ultimately was beheaded because of Christ, right? Yeah. So he's speaking to a church that says, "Hey, you're, don't be intimidated by them. You got to stand firm." Yeah. Oh man, like even the, hearing this part, like I'm like trying to soak it all in because it's like a. If you really look at it, there's no real periods there for a long time. So it's like a long run on sentence, <laughs> which Paul does often. But yeah, like with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, uh, living in such a way of good conduct, like all that together. And I'm just 
standing fast in the spirit. And then he goes on to say, in doing all those things, don't be terrified of your adversaries, which to them will be proof of perdition, is what mine says, um, that we are going to suffer for Christ. Like, wow. Like, <laughs> wow. So, like, and I think, I, I guess, putting that all together, my brain's going, like, is he saying this? So, Levi, you can correct me if not. But it's like, is he saying that by living in this such a way, um, it will be the downfall of them? Like, when they're coming against us for no good reason other than we follow Christ, like, people see that. Even people who don't follow Christ, who are just good people, see that and go, that's not right. Like, that's, a, that's a good person who is you know helping society they've helped people all around them they are they're good people they they're they're doing nothing that deserves death and mm -hmm. i feel like that that is another reason why christianity explodes when christians are persecuted mm -hmm. because when true christians who are living in love as the bible commands us to do as jesus asked us to do are been persecuted there's a lot of people who see that and they're like well, this ain't right and then they start like coming almost like on our side. Like they, they just like flock to it because they're like, this is not right. We want to stand for them. And as they stand for it, they start to learn, oh, this whole Christian thing. Yeah. Right. Because here he describes trusting in Christ as a privilege. Like, you know, I know there's a lot of talk today about certain privilege. You know, there are people who are privileged that they get things that just because of who they are, right, or their their race, or their or their socioeconomic status, that was that came out clearly, didn't it? But um, we are privileged that we get to trust in Christ. It's a privilege bestowed upon you. Here is this amazing thing you don't deserve—a privilege, trusting in Christ, and same privilege as suffering for Him. That when we suffer for Him. We've been given a privileged thing. Yeah, hmm. you did say that. And it's again, it's weird to hear at first. It's such a privilege to be suffering. But uh, multiple, multiple um, apostles said this. They said, uh, I am so glad that I get a share in the same suffering that Jesus did. Like, <laughs> yes, like, they're persecuting me just like they did Jesus. That's awesome. Like, wait a minute. Wait, wait. I don't know. I don't. At first, my heart goes, no, 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 no. But like, it's, it does get you kind of like, we really got to think differently, don't we? This is this is intriguing. So are you acting as father time today? Because that's the I, I end am. of Philippians 1. We are, we're actually at 20 minutes, a little under. So we could read a little bit more. Um, yeah, it's going to go by like uh, some of the other standard times. We're not halfway done. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> when you go by... Well, yeah. Especially well, let's the, jump into Philippians 2. Yep. Yeah, because he's talking about having the attitude of Christ. So Philippians 2, again, I'm reading the New Living Translation. One have second, the attitude. One second, one second. Oh, uh, 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 uh. Um, I think this whole section can go together, verse 1 through 4. Do 1 through 4, and we'll, we'll finish with that. Ta-da. All right. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for only your own interests, but take an interest in others, too. Maybe we don't want to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, the first, go, ahead. go ahead. I was going to say, uh, the first verse, uh, if there is any consolation in Christ, yes. Comfort of love, yes. Fellowship of the Spirit, yes. Uh, affection and mercy, yes. Then fulfill my joy, okay, by being like-minded. And I instantly, my mind went to this election. And uh, <laughs> I don't want to get political, but we did talk okay. about it um, for like a four-week series at the church. And we went, right. we talked about how uh, Jesus is king and how we, we need to not get caught up in this 
left side, right side. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I've been talking to uh, some older, wiser people um, who've been around longer than me, and they're saying they've never seen such a divide in the nation ever. They've never seen it in their lifetime. And I'm just thinking, like, we as Christians need to be different. So I have some some friends here, some some volunteers here at the church who uh, believe opposite of me, and we still have conversations. We still show love to each other. We talk about the Bible more than we talk about politics, and it's a grand thing. And it's so it is. It's it's fun to talk to each other. We leave smiling. Like that is what I picture here. Is like we as the Christian church need to be that way, mm -hmm. and and kind of remember that that we are supposed to be like minded. And again, if we can't agree on some of those other things, we can still come back and agree Jesus is king. Jesus is the only way. Mm -hmm. And that's that's where we're going to find the joy, right? So I think when he's starting this chapter with um, these questions, he's not actually saying, I want to find out your answer to this. Do you find any encouragement from belonging to Christ? I'll wait. No, he's, <laughs> these are rhetorical questions he's saying. You're right. Uh, is there any encouragement to belonging to Christ? Yeah, I mean, is there any comfort from his love? I'm sure the, the audience that reading this would go, well, yes, of course there is. Is there any fellowship together in the spirit? Because remember, this was the church. We talked about this um, whatever day we started this. <laughs> um, that this was a church that brought him great joy. And that yeah. we that these are the people in this church were people that were also in the book of Acts. So these were this was a tight-knit group of people that he loved. So he's already saying, hey, guys, since we know there's encouragement belonging to Christ, since, guys, there's comfort in his love, we have this fellowship together in the spirit. Your hearts are tender and compassionate. Now, let's put that to action by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, working together with that one mind and purpose. And, and if you want to fulfill the joy of a pastor, which Paul was definitely a pastor of many churches, uh, live this way. I mean, you want to see Byron smiling as a church live in such a way where mm -hmm. you have the same love, one accord, one mind. You know, we are together. What's that all mean? I mean, the Great Commission. We're all on the same mission. We are. We just talked about that a little bit ago, didn't we? Like to live is gain because we're going to be living for Christ. No, mm -hmm. to die is gain because we're going to go to heaven. But to live is Christ That's where Christ. we're going to be more fruitful. We're going to bring more people to Christ. To have that mindset, everyone being of that mind. Let and then here, um, can you switch? You're on your phone, right? On mm -hmm. the Bible app. Can you switch to the NIV and read verse three? Because that, that's the one I memorized long ago. Okay, here, it's I such a good verse to memorize. Let me do the compare and get the NIV. Apparently, that one doesn't work that way. I'm sorry. Young, you should be fast. I have to change the whole version. You can do like parallel and it gives you side by side comparisons, but I didn't have that pulled up in the NIV. Oh. All right. So this is definitely a version I'm familiar with. Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. There you go. That'll preach. Right That's there. actually a verse that I always forget where it's found exactly like i don't remember this philippians 2 3 but i i speak that concept to my children i say value others above yourself so if we're ever struggling with that i'll say now did you value him above yourself did you put him first no i didn't you know <laughs> yeah no no that's i've actually had that verse um as a verse of the week for my kids like we have a little a little chalkboard a little tiny one and mm -hmm. we put that verse on there, and that was the verse. That, and when I'm making food, I'll look at it and like, oh yeah. And it reminds me to teach the kids this concept of let nothing be done out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Like, ooh, nothing, nothing. Like, don't look at your own interest. Mm -hmm. Are we going to mess up? Yeah. Are we going to get selfish sometimes? Yeah. But I mean, this is just a reminder. If we get that memorized, we plant that deep in our minds. I think the Holy Spirit definitely uses that. We'll bring it up at the right moment when you're being a little. But it's like nothing. Like, if we did nothing out of selfish ambition, how much better would the world be? What, how would your day look different? Yeah. Not, saying, not even just your whole life or your outlook, but how would your day look different? 
Yeah. How would your relationships look different? How would people, how would your work look different? Like, oh my gosh. Like I, again, my brain's like picturing all kinds of like how this would change the world. It would change for one, it would change your family. It would change the church, like this one concept. And then the community itself, this would explode if we would just get this. Yeah. And take this seriously. All right. So is that a good place to stop as far as reading ahead in the Bible? I think so. Um, so a good opportunity for those watching to pray together. What's kind of cool is that people watch it at different times. So this prayer time can multiply throughout the day and be stretched out. You know? True, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so I'll say that I at the beginning, I think we see 60 people watching live. And then by the end of the day, 220 some views like. I've this. definitely I've I've seen it break 300 more than once when I've kind of been scrolling through and seen it. Like yeah. there's definitely so hey don't be afraid to share this with your friends. There are people literally I, I told this story a while ago, but there was a guy at the gym that I ran into and he's like, "How do I you look familiar?" I said, "Well, I work at Life Changing Church." He's like, "I've been I've seen you on like your videos." And I'm like, <laughs> "I'm pretty sure that this would be the only format that he would randomly run into me. It's the 714. So share it with random people, right? And um, because we're we're getting a, an opportunity to talk about the Word of God, and, and the Word of God never returns void. There you go. So shall we pray, Chris? Go for it, man. All right. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you have a heart that would want to teach us and mold us into people that do nothing for ourselves, truly selfless. No, that is the foundation of the Christian faith, is a selfless God doing a selfless act in calling others to be selfless. God, I pray that this, in this world we could live that way, that we could do things to protect the interests of other people. If that would be our focus, how this world would change God, I thank you that we get to sh share the gospel. We get to suffer with you. We get to have the privilege of trusting in you. God, we just commit ourselves to you. God, I pray that the people listening today will just find creative ways to share the gospel. And we just commit our day to you in Jesus' name. Oh, and Lord, I... I am humbled and just my heart jumps a little bit thinking about those leaders who who live a Philippians 2, 3 kind of life and who uh, just really put others' interests above their own. I, I love hearing when you hear leaders speaking and they care more about people than their own agendas. They care more about people than their own beliefs. Mm -hmm. And Lord, it is such a good thing. The people rejoice when a righteous man is leading, when a righteous woman is leading. The people rejoice. And, and Lord, I ask you will send more of them this, this election, more of them uh, into places of power, because this, this country does need a turnaround. We are, we are seeing so much hostility and so many things, and, and we really need to see a turnaround, Lord. And the only way that happens is if the people turn and the leaders turn from their wicked ways, turn from their selfishness, as this verse says, to, to care more about others' interests than their own, to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, to not care about the power, to not care about the, uh, the, the look at me, the spotlight, but they care more about what they're doing for the people and for future generations. Lord, we need more of that. And I just ask you will turn the hearts of some of those leaders uh, we all have leaders on our minds that we think are are rotten, who are who are not doing what they should be doing, who are against you. And Lord, I ask that you will turn their hearts. Let your people turn their from their wicked ways and repent. And as we do, Lord, let that be a sign. Let it move our leaders' hearts too, that they may turn. And as they turn, oh, such a healing in the land shall happen. And we will just see such a movement. And Lord, I ask the, today that you will just help us, everyone who hears this, that we will take a second to really ask ourselves if we are doing that. Are we selfless? Are we living for you alone and nothing else? 
do we care more about others than ourselves? And as always, I ask that you will bless this election, that you will take care of it, that in the end, when whatever happens, however everything falls, the votes end, that we as your people will be like-minded, trusting in you, knowing that in the end, we win, that victory is yours, that you will be king on earth, reigning over everyone and every knee will bow. Lord, help us as a church to come behind that as our battle cry, as we chase after those who are lost. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. Hey, hopefully uh, you guys enjoy the youth pastor takeover again. <laughs> and you'll yeah. be so happy when somebody else is here tomorrow. I don't know. <laughs> But, Chris, it was good talking to you again. Oh, yeah. And it looks like they'll be able to take off in Philippians 2 tomorrow. That sounds good. Hey, have a good rest of your day, guys. See you, everyone.